I'm happy to introduce Paul Nelson, um, who is in, in my experience and a little bit of research I did, one of the most active poets I've come across. He, he actually, he is a, a, a full, he's an active poet. He, he does all sorts of stuff. The, poet, the um, poems on postcards, um, Splab, which is Seattle Poetry Lab. He has interviewed a list of poet, poets, um, any one of whom I would have loved to have met. Um, and he's become very active in, in Sika, in Subud, since he was opened in 2004, I think. He now does a regular Sika, um, what do I call it? announcements and things yes so um and i've heard him reading his poetry what well, he doesn't read he performs his poetry at congresses when i've heard him sometimes with the flautist so i'm very happy to introduce paul nelson go for it paul thanks emmanuel happy birthday i'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity and, and grateful i was chosen to be part of it um, and i'm grateful you're, you're all here and um, that I have this opportunity, and it's 11.13, so I'm going to note the time and act accordingly. Um, I just want to dedicate this reading to the memory of Michael McClure, who died on May 4th, and whose work uh, has influenced me more than any other poet, and probably human, that I've ever met. And so his, his passing is a great loss. And he dedicated um, his journal back in the early 60s um, his journal dedication went for the protection of all beings. So I would like to add that in honor of Michael, and I would like to recite his poem, Action Philosophy from 1974, which starts with a quote from Thoreau. That government is best that governs least. Let me be free of ligaments and tendencies to change myself into a shape that's less than spirit. Let me be a wolf, a caterpillar, a salmon, or an otter sailing in the silver water beneath the rosy sky. Were I a moth or condor, you'd see me fly. I love this meat of which I'm made. I dive in it to find the simplest vital shape. Ah, here's the child. What's liberty when one class starves another? So that's Michael McClure, his poem Action Philosophy. He had, another, he had another line about philosophy in a later poem that said philosophy is a lead life jacket decorated with brilliant bubbles. <laughs> so he believed in an action philosophy, and I think the Latihan is an action philosophy, and he was opened in Subud and wrote about it as I posted on the Sika blog. The last time I saw Andrew Hall was in Puebla, and perhaps some of you, the last time I saw you was in Puebla, Mexico, and I recited a poem on the stage there, uh, wearing this uh, vest, I think, that I got in Puebla <laughs> as well. And so I'd like to read that poem again. It was well received, and it's sort of a signature poem for me, and it's for one of my heroes, Frida Kahlo, in two parts. <clears throat> Frida one. Frida smiles and winks at the camera. Frida after surrealism, after two abortions, after 1925 streetcar accident and iconic unibrow, Aragin sees his blackbird wings, I think, after Diego and machismo in black, yellow, red, tan dress, I am not sick, she says, shot by her lover in color, never wincing as far as I can see, conditioning an image eternal for sainthood, I am not sick. 35 operations, two abortions, surrounded by skulls, pentadine, morphine, not sick, says she, broken. Two, Frida, let your hair down. Frida, don't look at me like that. Frida, leave Diego, do not walk, bolt. Frida, won't you steal the masculine hat of the accident you call Diego and bury it behind Casa Azul? Frida in living color. Frida festooned in Mexican reds and blacks and tans, golds, yellows, y rosados y blanco rosas. 
Frida, why was surrealism a Mexican breakfast while the feet of the wounded table bleed and you paint tendrils on your 1940 image and only the skull smiles? Frida, who let the spider monkey loose to carry on and live carnal dreams alongside deer, turtle doves, parrots, una familia sustituta con el elefante y la paloma? Diego, ¿y tú? Dime, Frida, ¿de qué color es la flor en que tus cenizas esparcidas en la selva se convirtieron? Frida, tell me, what is the color of the flower your jungle scattered ashes became? So, uh, Halima Collingwood said, read some American sentences. And... Um, and I pulled out some old ones and I thought, I don't want to read the old ones that are published in different journals. I'll just read from my pocket journal that I carry around. And thanks to Andrew Schelling, started doing this 20 years ago, started carrying around a pocket journal. And so when I see something out in the, in the world and I think that's interesting, I write it down. And if it's, if I've, if it's a 17 syllables worth of poetry, I put it in the form of a 17 syllable poem. So I read some to Bhakti today. And so these ones have the Bhakti Watts seal of approval and um, gives you a sense maybe of our life during this shelter in place. <clears throat> I showed people the picture of the lake out in front of us. And so looking at the swallows is one activity. Swallow joy, teasing the lake's surface with mastery of gravity. That was from yesterday. From the locust tree, stolen locust blossoms, maybe a weed to you, what smells like May to us. My coronavirus weight loss plan, rabbit portions of peasant food. <laughs> we have an eight-year-old daughter. We've been reading her Indian stories at night, classic stories from Native American lore. And so this one is a glimpse into that. Ella's sex education through coyote stories. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and I told her I wouldn't read that one. So um, I'm going to uh, pick one more. The park here, they closed the uh, parking lot for the boat launch. And um, one of the geese has, they had six, I think, but now they have five goslings. And uh, it's nice to see the goslings in the park. We check on them every day. And the American sentence goes, when did we ever vote in automobiles over goslings? I demand a recount. Okay, and one more, um, one more uh, COVID-related poem. This is going to be published in Journal from the Plague Year, which is based in New York. And I was asked for a, some COVID poetry, shelter-in-place poetry. And I've been writing these very blocky uh, non-sonnet sonnets, 14-line prose poems, and I'm calling them Sonetos de Cascadia. And this one is COVID-19 sonnet, and it has an epigraph from Paul Celan, being, no heaven is, no earth, and the memory of both extinguished, but for the one ash tree believing nuthatch. COVID-19 sonnet. Earth closed, which was the sky's wish, the birds, trees, unspoken mammal wish, as if heterotrophs had a vote and should, and then do, when they conspire to halt human progress for a few weeks, lighten the air, Unclog the cities, add a dash of duende to the stew we call life without sports, without eating out, within no closer than six feet of the average human germ-spewing capability. Earth closed as a reset button, as in what's in it besides rat race for you, as in how might you act in prison but still cooking your own meals, as in get to enjoy, really enjoy, brown rice. Earth first, finally. We had it coming. We stable geniuses, knowing humans have all the answers, all the technology, all the gear, except for face masks, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, and ventilators. Duendification of life resynchronizes us with the nuthatch and red wing, the coot raft and seagulls. And there is no panic buying by the lake. There is no hoarding except for squirrel. There's nothing but these last three days of winter and a slight sense of the new normal in late capitalism. 
duendification is uh, an extrapolation of a, a term by uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, who talked about duende being a uh, sort of a quality in certain artists. Some singers may sing, have perfect pitch, but they don't have the gravitas of say someone like Billie Holiday, who I think Lorca would say had the duende. So that's where that word comes from. And I think I'm, I got, I've got some time for some of these poems. My book, A Time Before Slaughter, was released in 2009, late 2009, and the 10th anniversary edition came out uh, here during the shelter in place. I had a Zoom launch, and I've added to it extensively with a whole nother book, which is called Pig War and Other Songs of Cascadia. Slaughter is the original name of Auburn, Washington, which was founded as the town of Slaughter, and the Pig War uh, was an event that um, happened between the US and what became Canada regarding the jurisdiction of certain islands, which after 12 years of joint military occupation on one of them, San Juan Island, uh, they were awarded to the Americans. They weren't specific about what strait they were talking about in a treaty. So um, the, the pig war was the only war the United States ever had a chance to fight and didn't. The only casualty was a pig and nobody knows who ate the bacon. So I'll start with um, some work from the first part about the history of Auburn, Washington, or the former Slaughter. And um, Slaughter's a railroad town. My dad was a railroad guy. So I lived there for 17 and a half years, and you could always hear the train horns. And this poem tells you, in a way, how Slaughter was built. It's called, Where Slaughter Got His Velocity. And the river mentioned here, the Stuck River. Well, that's a great, great way to start a poem. One word is slaughter, one word is stuck. You're off and running. Where slaughter got his velocity. Slaughter's the counterpoint of rushing flow of the stuck and more train horns. In 1853, the U.S. Congress authorized four transcontinental routes for exploration. One, surveyed by Isaac Stevens, Washington Territory's first governor, recommended Stampede Pass, east of slaughter. In 1860, presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln spent a hundred grand, twice as much as the little giant, to win the presidency. Abe, railroad lawyer, getting fat from the Illinois Central, which got a land grant with the little giant's support. Honest Abe gave more land to railroads than any other president, land not his to grant. In 1862, he signed the first Pacific Railway Bill, the Union Pacific. Central Pacific, land grant, amended in 64, resulted in the Credit Mobilier scandal. UP, 11 million acres free, 27 million in bonds. CP, 8 million acres free, 24 million in bonds. July 2, 1864, Northern Pacific land grant. Millions of acres of 19th century land grants were not sold to settlers as the U.S. Congress intended. Burlington Northern, Burlington Resources, Plum Creek Timber, Meridian Oil, Catellus, Weyerhaeuser, Frederick, railroad empire builder Jim Hill's next door neighbor in St. Paul began his career deforesting the pine forests of Wisconsin and Minnesota. These the corporations who got the land intended for settlers, land they rape, spoil, and trade back to the government today, not the government's land to grant, remember. It became the velocity of slaughter, a changer's dream. The checkerboard system and the sell-off of land for revenues created the shape of the Muckleshoot Res. Northern Pacific chose Tacoma over Seattle for the western terminus. This benefited slaughter. By 1877, the Seattle and Walla Walla started service to Renton, then slaughter, but soon went bankrupt, halted service to slaughter. Railroads were the Enron of their day. U.S. Ninth Circuit Court Judge Lorenzo Sawyer, perhaps sensing that all things have sentience, ruled corporations are people. In 1885, Kent Farmer Foghorn Green convened a meeting with Northern Pacific representatives. Service to slaughter resumed. When in 1893, James Hill made Seattle the terminus of his great northern, more settlers discovered slaughter in the valley. An old woman 
visiting from back east on a train from Tacoma to Seattle, heard the brakeman make the call of the local towns. Deeringer, which she heard as danger. Stuck, and she became more agitated. Slaughter, and she was said to faint. When she came to, and the porter of the Ohio House Hotel called, right this way to the slaughterhouse, she was out cold again. By 1895, Slaughter had seven saloons and 300 residents. Slaughter had a railroad and the train age state-of-the-art velocity to carry out his will. Slaughter is the glint of summer sunlight reflecting off the morning stuck under the low moan of train horns. Always train horns, inevitable train horns, lilting train horns. Letter 13, Plum Stain, taken from a phrase by Andre Breton on the road to San Romano. Poetry found in the sky like giant Mars chasing the full ripe plum moon as if in love, interstellar courting is how bodies in the heavens demonstrate, made gravity desirable again in the August night sky above the Honda's pounding bass, a silent witness above the bed in which dreams of hook shots and fast breaks are kept. In the slaughter sky, her makeup perfect, this ripe plum full moon fallen plums messed up sidewalks all over town, sheets of falling unwanted fruit. The Russians learn about slaughter, sun rises, plums fall, and Mars ran away with the moon. Poetry, the desire to kiss eternity, lives to leave a ripe plum stain on the sidewalk of the future in slaughter, where the deep wounds open but don't reveal flesh, deep woods open, reinvent themselves in an alder moment to show slaughter the way. And I, I think I'm down to one last poem, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to skip the slaughter book and read two poems from Michael from the Postcard Fest and, and call it a show. And I understand we're supposed to hang around and have a discussion or a Q&A, and I'm all up for that. I'm grateful for your kind attendance. It's weird to do these things because you hear no reactions, but then again, it's probably the best uh, for, the, for the reading to the mute folks. So um, I've been writing these postcards now for 14 years, and this year I'm calling all my poems Postcards from the Pandemic. And the subtitle one of this is Peasant Food. And I just have to say that Bhakti and I, um, we've been eating a lot of Paul, you're muted. Unmute yourself. I don't know. I don't know. So um, postcards from the pandemic. I make the cards there. So. Um, oh, sorry. We. Sorry. Uh, you was muted. You have to right. say it again. Sorry. Postcards from the pandemic. Subtitled peasant food. This one here. <clears throat> Quoting Michael McClure. It is all a garden, a dance growing out of myself. Michael Wright, Michael McClure. And the garden grows, new tendrils rooted in the poet, sprouting into some serial future, linking Bloomington to Dubai to Squire Park with a taste of sautéed poblanos, pan-fried in the pandemic, as the peasant food diet experiment reveals more personal myths worth abandoning. And I got a poblano there for the, for the cards. And another one with a quote from Michael McClure who was known for his beast language. And I'm working on a theory that him being opened in Subud allowed him the freedom to create this beast language, which he did uh, most notably in a book in 1965, I think it was, called Ghost Tantras, 99 poems that mix English with beast language, such as the word that'll end this poem. And so this, um, this comes from his essay, Reason, in which he's describing a man doing latihan. If his eyes were not already closed, the pleasure would shut them. He has allowed his consciousness to become a blank field. Michael McClure. And so goes the rebel lion. 
rebellion, on surrender to the great life force. And so goes his one last act of mammal patriotism, splash of Johnny Walker Black on his lips. This is reason, but so is grah. And when I read that poem to Jason Wirth, a philosopher, he said that Deleuze said that philosophy is an animal cry in search of syntax. So that's 19 minutes. Thank you for your time. And you can unmute everybody, please. <laughs> more, more. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Encore. Encore. You want to hear one more? Is that okay, Rosita, yes. if I read? Yes. When yes. Left, yes. When I left, uh, thanks. When I left, I'm grateful. Well, when I left Auburn, uh, before I even knew I was leaving, I was writing these elegies for slaughter, which are based on the Duino elegies by Rilke, who also wrote them in, a, in such a way I would call them received, his Duino elegies and his sonnets to Orpheus, and also written after George Bowering, the great Canadian poet, who was the first parliamentary poet laureate of Canada, his Carisdale elegies. So I'll read the last, it, it was the poem that closed the old book, and then now is sort of midway point, the Elegy for Slaughter, number 10, which throws a lot of my personal mythology in. And it's three pages, about three minutes long. After summer rain, angels would trample the wet grounds outside the carnival of glands. And yet dead poets always get the last word. Perhaps time sweetens with each deeply felt elegy. We see their picture as if they'd live forever. The day before the Times writes their obit. It is the rare July angled rain can eat Northwest faces, shudder what's left of the white blossoms who refuse to complain about their well-timed descent. Unlike slaughter, the trees the Nutka Rose, Wild Ginger, Sitka, Columbine, Dogwood, Indian Paintbrush, the Fireweed remain neutral, hold, like Mount Tahoma does, the resonance of every step and waits patient for us to honor our greed. Inside, in silence, except for Friday night car tires humming on wet road below the sound waves of earth cutting through space, Underneath the dimmest constellation and the sound of the lonely night's last freight train horn, dead poets pose as angels, send metaphors for your verse, remind you the whole world's alive inside that green wheel spinning in your chest, making a mandala of spent matches from lit prayer candles and pink rose blossoms offered to the lady. You are only a reflection of a reflection of the skill your parents had in the lightning flash that became you and for which you yearn to return endlessly checking the weather forecast while the stuck river rolls beyond the spot of diversion. You get a hernia as your marriage falls apart or your nose bleeds for recognition, but the grace saving you is the extraordinary patience of dead poets. Dead poets in the garden scaring raccoons. Dead poets animating the cat's eyes for a moment, moving molecules to drop white blossoms for your amusement. Dead poets caught in your throat in the fetal position, like latent antepasados turning the last blood fire burn into your richest, deepest song. Sunlight's headed south now, faster than the cat can comprehend, makes the tips of stuck river waves more white, animates coyote's smile lubricates the stunts of stellar jays, keeps light shining on slaughter, not waiting for better weather. And a poet you knew will become that light, or that latent angel, or that force moving molecules to amuse your evening walk faster than your aging synapses can flash across their gap. He who could live beyond the last parenthesis, she who could hold fire in her hand, he who makes better weather for those who honor their ancestral land. She who marks the Northwest July suns closing arson orange and apricot rays in skin, blood fire and melted wax. 
She who tamps the never-ending flow can withstand every parlor trick slaughter could ever conjure with a rare commitment to every blossoming every species has ever known. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yes, really. Thank you so much. I, I would like to uh, take a moment to uh, express my appreciation to Paul and also thank you for your Sika USA blog, Paul. And I want to ask you a couple of things. Um, do you know Michael McClure's friend, Suzanne Mowat? No. <clears throat> Hello? I, I do not know no. her. Okay. The George Bowering reference, uh, was it dead, po dead poets pose as angels? Um, well, if you look at Carisdale elegies, and okay. then if you, if you look at my uh, elegies, elegies for slaughter, You'll see that I what I did was I took Duino's elegies and 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 Bowering's elegies and then I shaped them, um, replacing their imagery with my own, and so there are a lot of kind of parallels between those two works. I kind of grafted from those two works, so well, I saw yeah. the I saw the yeah, George. It, did. it reminded me of uh, when I heard that phrase of Wim Wenders' um, Wings of Desire. You remember that film? I did not see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With the the angels were in the library, and anyway, uh, yeah. I, I recommend you to see it. And um, also, do you know Brian Fawcett? I know of him. I know okay. um, Barry McKinnon, and I know Sharon Thiessen, and yes. I've been to George, your hometown. So uh, in in yeah, that Sharon and Brian were married at one point, but. Um, yeah, right. So Brian and Sharon and I were in high school together, and we published our very first um, anthology of poetry in high school, and we did it on... Emeograph. Uh, uh, well, no, we rolled it like block printing out. Yeah, it's called Impressions. Anyway, I'll talk to you privately about that another time because Michael McClure and Suzanne Mowat uh, were friends. And um, the day, I think it was your birthday recently, wasn't it? No, 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 not, no. Anyway, the day he died, I was in touch with Suzanne. So um, you're bringing up lots of wonderful imagery because of your craft and connection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zulawati. I appreciate your kind words. I'm yeah. delighted to, to help connect Subut uh, cultural creatives through the Sika USA blog, which uh, has had content about a year and a half every week now. Paul, can I ask you a couple of questions? Um, as I listen to your performance and its exuberance, um, and there's a nobility that you bring to poetry um, that uh, strikes me. I'm wondering, when, when did you become a poet? How, when did you consider yourself a poet in your own evolution? Well, I started reading bedtime. Thanks for the nobility comment, because as Subud members, we're trying to become noble humans. So that's, the Latihan must be working on some level, which is, uh, is validating to hear that. And I'm, and I'm grateful for that. Um, some of my American sentences you would not find very noble, <laughs> and, and Bhakti <laughs> warns me about reading them in public. Um, but it's an it's an opportunity to exercise a, a wider bandwidth of what might be considered noble. I think the Cuban in me, uh, my mom was born in Cuba, so I think that results in in a pretty pretty large bandwidth, especially for humor. Um, my daughter Rebecca just turned uh, twenty nine, and I would read her bedtime stories at night when she was growing up. She was born in 91. And, uh, and um, she, um, you know, I, I kind of got sick of the hungry caterpillar and stuff like that after a while. So I started reading her uh, regular stories. I read to her the strange life of Ivan Osakin. 
bedtime story. And uh, Moby Dick, although we didn't get all the way through wow. Moby Dick, she said, uh, Dad, I don't need bedtime story stories anymore. I have an iPod. So that's, that's how that ended. But I, I would read her poems, and I started reading her from uh, an, an anthology of six American poets, Langston Hughes, William Carlos Williams, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, uh, Robert Frost, and Wallace Stevens. And, um, and I, started, I started interviewing poets, and then I had a chance to interview Ginsburg that year. And that's when it really took off, my interest in writing it and reading it and interviewing people and learning about it. When Ginsburg interviewed me, I was pretty ignorant about poetry, and he kept looking in my eye for a glimmer of recognition, uh, but he wasn't <laughs> getting it. So, um, so I thought, you know what, I'm pretty ignorant about this, so I have to learn a little bit more. And, so, and then meeting Michael McClure and interviewing him the next year was really the big thing, and his book, Three Poems, uh, which uh, I read in the Olympic National Park uh, and just blew my head off. Uh, and of course, McClure having been opened in Subud, maybe there was part of the Latihan that was coming through McClure to me. I do know that he's probably the most open poet I've ever read, and that is a stance to which I aspire. Can I ask as well, Paul, about the Subud connection? You um, came to Subud when, in 2004, was it? Yeah, um, I, was very, I have been very interested in alternative health, and uh, someone through that community said, you got to see this guy who does this practice he calls ontological kinesiology, and uh, his name is Solihin Tom, and uh, through Solihin and Alicia, I, I became aware of Subud, and uh, got opened, and then dropped out, um, started getting interested in the Tibetan Bun work, the, the indigenous religion of Tibet, and there were workshops on Wiccaninish Island off the coast of Vancouver Island near Tofino. <clears throat> I went three summers. They were about a week, week long workshop. Well, they were two three day workshops with a free day sandwich in the middle on this island. And, uh, and then I got back into Subud again through Solahim. He said, come on, let's go to Latihan. And I said, no, no, I can't go. And he said, how come? And I said, I don't have my card. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> No, you don't need the card. <laughs> Come on. And I had an experience in the Portland Subud House that was really powerful. That was really my first real engagement, strong engagement with Latian. I got a clear voice saying, do this now. And I did it. And I've been together since. In fact, and then it was shortly after that with Soli, I went to the National Congress in Vancouver, Washington, where I think I met Halima Collingwood and other Subud members with whom I've been friends since then. So. And about your creative process through the day, do you wake up with poems in your head? Uh, do they come to you while you walk, <laughs> while you're sitting on the can? Uh, how does this work for you? Yeah, um, well, my brain, as Bhakti will tell you, uh, works in associations. It's really relational thinking. So she might say something, um, I, you know, she, I said, how'd you sleep? And she said, I couldn't get to sleep at all. So I would... In my mind, all of a sudden, the fifth dimension's going, last night, I couldn't get to sleep at all. You know, so if it's not a song, it's a, a lyric, it's a, it's a line from a poem, or it's, um, it's a joke, you know. Uh, so those, something will usually come up, and quite often it's a song, or quite often it's a line of poetry. Quite often it's from Michael McClure's poem, Dolphin Skull. I'll be doing a little primer and memory of Michael McClure 11 o'clock on Monday, Memorial Day, and I understand his widow, uh, Amy, is hoping to attend. So uh, people who haven't heard of McClure, want to know more about him, will have a chance to be part of our Undercommons Literary Salon Monday at 11. So yeah, very much relational thinking, and you know, the American sentences serve to keep my hand in it, because if I see something outside that could be a poem, you know, most of the time you think, well, I don't have time to write a poem, but if it's only 17 syllables, then you do have time to jot it down and maybe tweak it a little bit later. And uh, often the last tweak is before it goes down on the paper and, uh, and goes out into a book or a manuscript. And at the end of this year, it'll be 20 days of writing one of those every day for 20, 20, year, 20 years of writing one a day. So that'll be at the end of this year. And I in, intend to put out a, a larger version of the book, American Sentences. 
Matt Treese, who I think was on this call for a moment, there he is, uh, he said, you need to give them more space, let them breathe more. So I think there'll be fewer poems, but more years of them and um, more space between the sentences. Paul, could you type in the chat section what you just mentioned that's happening on Monday that you're presenting on Michael? Yeah, um, the easy thing for me to do is I'll uh, type in my website because that I can remember. <laughs> um, and you can see the link there, but oop, if I could type my name right. Yeah, and you can see the link there. And um, oh, that was just to Emmanuel. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, paulenelson.com. Uh, Did you hit, hit enter? There, great. So, so the link is there and people are welcome and uh, I'll do a presentation of maybe 30 or 40 minutes. I'm going to read a long part of Dolphin Skull and, um, and hope that Matt is good with the, with the mute trigger there. And then, um, then there will be a dialogue. So we have about 90 minutes on Monday and it's Memorial Day, which is appropriate. So, and, you know, Michael is a, is a huge hero for me. And, um, um, you know, when, you, when you're 87 and you're not w feeling well, it's hard to really feel bad for someone, but I mean, obviously grief, as we all know, kind of has its own biorhythms and you never know when it's going to hit. Well, I love your poetry. I love your reading. I don't always understand everything because it does come. There's so many images coming one after another, but it's colorful. Your words, you know, it just, I don't even have to understand what you're saying. I just love hearing it. Thanks, Halima. You know, in McClure's book, Three Poems, he said something which I think directly addresses that. He said, um, and I, rather than, since I love being in my library, this is so perfect. He said, um, <laughs> and this is the book that I brought into the Olympics. You can see it's been kind of beat up. <laughs> um, three poems with a poem, Dolphin Skull. He said, what is urgent is not the quantity that is understood as one reads a poem, but how much one uses the richness of one's being to have the experience of the poem. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think, I mean, I think that, you know, especially North Americans are kind of hung up on meaning. What does it mean? There's some secret meaning that I get or that I don't get. And I don't think that's a, a good way to enjoy poetry. I think if you get one good line or one good image, that sticks with you, or even if there's a rhythm, you know, we never, we never ask uh, Duke Ellington, what does the eight, take the A train mean? <laughs> and he also said something which is very good poetics. Duke Ellington said, if it sounds good, it is. So I go with that. Thank you for your <laughs> Yeah, T.S. Eliot said it for me when I was about 17, I read it, something he said, and he said, poetry can communicate before it is understood. I like that line. Exactly. I have a question about beast language. Is it throughout all of Michael McClure's poems or is there one anthology that it got launched from? Um, the, the original book, which came out in 1965, is this book, uh, Ghost Tantras. And then, oh, I'm sorry, that's Meet Science Essays. Hello. Well, the, the, the anniversary edition is this. This is the 50th anniversary edition, so you can see him made Hold up. Hold on a second. I have to get to speaker oh. view. Uh, Ghost Tantras, okay. And um, I'm going to read this one uh, on Monday, but I, I love this so much because it mixes. And he started throwing in Grar near the end of his life. He started throwing in. I remember reading it in Auburn at the old Splab. And uh, he'd end each poem with, Rawr, if it was a beast poem or not. Beast line. And then one he didn't. And I was in the back of the slab. And he finished and he didn't say it. So I went, Rawr, and he goes, cry yourself. <laughs> so um, 51. I, and the way he mixes beast language with English is just transformative. I love to think of the red purple rose in the darkness cooled by the night. We are served by machines making satins of sounds. 
Each blot of sound is a bud or a star. Body eats bouquets of the ear's vista. Gar, booty, ears, nose, eyes, deem thou. No, na, oh, trur, vur, na, daru, mi, na, dru, sirch, na, vi. The machines are too dull when we are lion poems that move and breathe when we brood. Han, vi, maikatov, charu, shvi, va, no, in, it is, quan, ethos, pro. <laughs> That's what it looks like on the Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You never know what someone's going to get when they get a postcard that says Grar. <laughs> Paul, Paul, this is Sandra. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little more to Jason's idea about uh, syntax. To lose his comment that um, philosophy is animal cry in search of syntax. And I think that's just our, I think that's where violence comes from. I think violence comes from the inability to communicate. And when people can't communicate, that's when they take up violence. And I've seen that in my own life. When I can't explain something, I throw or break something I have in the past. So I think that's what Deleuze was getting to. And, uh, you know, McClure felt that he was a mammal patriot. And he, he said that any man who doesn't realize he's an animal is less than one. And so when we realize we're animals, I think that our, you know, factory farming practices are going to end. Our lack of reverence in dealing with other mammals is going to end. And uh, we're going to have a better planet that doesn't have as much uh, greenhouse gas emissions and saves the biosphere. So I think those, all, all those things are related. Great, that got me right in the solar plexus. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. I think this is uh, brilliant clothing words <laughs> here for Lucida. our session. Yes, Emmanuel. Who is the next poet? I don't know. I have to. Me, be. Miranda. Miranda. Miranda Hamilton. Oh, yeah. Miranda Hamilton. <laughs> Thank oh, that's, that's, that's the Miranda I was thinking. Perhaps you were the Miranda. Lives you didn't recognize London. me, Emmanuel. <laughs> you didn't recognize me. I used to be dark. Yeah, we, uh, we, very dark. We knew one another years ago. So yes. the Miranda so is our next poet next Friday. Is that correct, Miranda? Yes. yes. Now that I've, I've got sound, if I didn't find sound, I was going to forget it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Can I just okay. ask Paul one um, quick question? Can I? Hey. Let me let me hang out for let let them close the reading and then I'll hang out for anyone who still wants to chat for a few minutes. Miranda, mm -hmm. I just one more thing I want to say to Miranda. Mm -hmm. May I request your poem, The Fox? Yes, I will. <laughs> my first poem. Okay, was thank tired you. and the foxes came to the garden. It's one of my favorites. So. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, good. so then well, let's say I, goodbye to the audience. Just for the I, audience, say goodbye. Goodbye. Adios. Goodbye.